When I was a young man, I carried the pack, and I lived over There was a retired colonel there who gave a speech, and his main claim was that Canadians owe all our freedoms and our democratic institutions to the military, which I thought was uh, balderdash. Um, so that really got me going. He was there and at the park and said uh, freedom of the press you owe it to the military this kind of thing well that's not how the world works and that got me going as it were to think about the culture of remembrance and commemoration Matilda, as the boat pulled away from the key amidst the cheers flag waving in tears we sailed off to Gallipoli. I uh, contacted a bunch of people I know here in Kingston and dragooned them, or if you want to put it in military terms, press ganged them into uh, getting together to put together this organization that became Peace Quest. Um, we had a potluck supper here at my house, I think in around 2013, and shared ideas, and out of that came a certain amount of energy. We were from the arts, from education, from religion, from non-religion, like just, I don't know, it was like, here comes everybody. I wanted the emphasis to be on non-violence and that nonviolence within ourselves, within our relationships, that would overflow into the world. And I think um, when we gathered, one of the things we did when we first came together was to try and define peace. And we decided that, um, let's not define it, let's not put it into a box, but let's describe peace. That peace is an active way of living, seeking to resolve conflicts cooperatively, nonviolently, respecting the well being of the earth and all its peoples. A reading of a proclamation from the Mayor and City Council of Kingston. Whereas the United Nations has declared that September 21st be celebrated annually as International Day of Peace. And whereas the Kingston Group Peace Quest is dedicating an old oak tree and planting a young tree to build awareness of peace activities and encourage all citizens to do something positive in Kingston, across Canada, and around the world. And here's where I come in. I'm Jolene Simcoe, and in 2014, I became Peace Quest's sole part-time staff person for the next six years. I had the privilege and honor of working with Jamie, Pauline, and the others to bring their dreams and their plans into reality, bring in some ideas of my own, and document the whole process along the way. Over those years, there was a very clear wish uh, that our strategies, successes, and the lessons we learned along the way be shared with the wider community in some way. Please welcome, on tuba, Andy Rush, and on banjo, Jeff Piker, as they lead us in a rousing rendition of Down by the Riverside. Five years, Peace Quest Kingston coordinated dozens of events around four areas or streams as we call them. They are culture, education, policy, and faith. And that first year coincided with Jamie Swift's tour uh, for the release of uh, Warrior Nation. 
and relationships were built and solidified during that year that led to new Peace Quest groups popping up in other parts of the country. The strongest ones were in Regina, Saskatchewan and Victoria, BC, who both ran amazing programming of their own. But for the purposes of our conversation today, we're going to focus on the pitfalls, strategies of Peace Quest Kingston specifically. So instead of talking too much about exactly what we did, join me and some key volunteers as we reflect on what worked, what didn't, and why, in hopes that it helps you in your journey to create a better world. Quest was an incredible success. We only had five years, we knew that from the start, but we made great, great links with people and communities. We made links with chapters and existing groups in five other Canadian cities, but we produced lasting resources. Because um, people need their holidays and people um, only have so much energy and uh, we had great dreams, but our capacity, we had to every now and then really come back to that. But do we have the capacity for that? The, the work has to take into account what other people, what are, what's going on in other parts of people's lives. And, uh, you know, for example, I have a grandchild. I have many grandchildren, so I need time for that. At the beginning, I thought, this doesn't sound like it's going to be very helpful. But it actually was, because we used our time very, very strategically. It allowed people to tell themselves and we allowed us to tell each other that this wasn't going to go on on some sort of endless highway of, of activity. So I think that was important. Most of the people who were attracted to working as part of the steering committee um, were busy people who did lots of volunteer activities and giving it a deadline for its closure um, made one realize that it was doable and not just another thing that they were going to add on to very busy schedules. Because the, the, one of the things that causes volunteers to burn out is there seems to be no end. Um, so this had very uh, concrete parameters around it. And I think whenever any of us felt, oh, this is just so much and when is it going to end, we reminded ourselves we know exactly when it's going to end. So it, um, it, was, really, um, it was really inspirational to have a closing date. The fact that we had that deadline prevented burnout. Yes, there was a beginning and there was an end. And there was enthusiasm and hard work in between. It's a song about love between the brothers and sisters. Oh, oh, we rarely tried to mount something on our own. We always tried to work with a partner in order to access and leverage their networks and their capacity. Uh, we didn't actually, in the culture stream, we didn't actually um, produce a lot of stuff. We basically uh, took advantage of the work that was being done by others, uh, theater companies, um, and we kind of piggybacked on that and created sort of value-added add-ons to um, focus the discussion around peace and war. Um, so uh, I think we we're able to leverage a fair bit um, by doing that. I think that's an excellent strategy for a small group of people who have very ambitious goals. And therefore, we could work together with other organizations using their strengths and their expertise and their resources sometimes shared um, to accomplish more than we could do on our own. We found existing public spaces, whether they were theater productions, whether they were concerts, whether they were events at an art gallery, in which we could, uh, as it were, insert ourselves and, and bring to those conversations issues about war and peace. The theater companies have their own networks. The Isabel has a, a network. The, the World Remembers, we did a, a reading of, of a uh, of a piece that the world remembers had developed and it had a network. Most things in life get done, you know, sure because they're good ideas and sure because you've got good resources and whatever, but more, most important ingredient is relationship. 
we would never have been able to get our message out as broadly without um, sort of piggybacking on existing, with existing organizations. Peace in the heart, that's where it starts. Peace in the home, that's where it grows. To peace in the world. Meetings are intimidating. A lot of people, when they see that they're invited to a meeting, they don't want to go. A lot of meetings um, are very formal. And we didn't have an actual goal or a destination yet. We just wanted to get people together and share with them our concept of doing something about peace over a five-year period. And a potluck was a very relaxing way in which to do it. The potlucks are, are the best meal you could ever find. And there's something about when you have to contribute something and receive what others contribute, you know, that goes into your very system. And you receive their gifts and their creativity as well as giving your own. And there was such great exchange and you add a little wine to that, and it just opens up. The famous Canadian pacifist Ursula Franklin um, often said that her vision of an ideal society was like a potluck supper where everybody brought something that they were good at and shared it all around equally. You start by building uh, social glue through um, yeah, through food and uh, storytelling and so forth, um, and then you you come to uh, you know once people have have developed a kind of a, some kind of attachment to each other, you get them talking about the substance, the content of the project. That's a very um, lovely environment to meet people who you may not know, and also be with people you might know. So it was very engaging, everybody had something to contribute, and we shared, and that was very much the tone of the organization from start to finish. I think that social cohesion is important, no matter what your cause is. I think people work together much better when they know each other. And the way you know each other is by not just focusing on the task at hand, but um, sharing laughter, sharing personal stories, sharing aspirations. And once we know each other on a personal level, we commit more to one another as friends, and therefore we commit more to the project, and we don't let people down. Uh, if, if the heart of, of any family gathering is, is uh, sharing a meal, then how much more is that the case when you bring a group of people together who may not know each other, but who are equally committed to a cause? At every meeting, uh, we thought about who had helped us in the past month, so we wrote thank you letters. We sent updates to our donors on a regular basis to tell them how we had spent the money and the successes that we had. We reached out to our, our donors, particularly the women's religious orders, and we invited them to come to a final celebration. Um, rather than making it impersonal, we tried to keep it very personal and we tried to always include them with regular updates about what we were doing so that they, they were part of the group even though they were at a distance and that their contribution was financial rather than physical labor. A lot of organizations fail to thank the people that work with them. And even though some of the people have already been thanked, now that we've come to an end, we've compiled an ultimate uber list of all the people and we're going to write to them all once again, summing up all that we've done. I think we, we wanted to be serious about the gravity of coming up with different ways of commemorating war, ways that emphasized peace, but at the same time balanced off with the gravity, the seriousness, we wanted to have some fun ourselves and in our work with cultural organizations, people go to theatrical performances, choral performances, because they really get a charge out of it. For in some small way, it's, it's fun to do. So the idea of having fun is connected not only to internal group dynamics, but to what we developed as a really important working relationship with cultural groups. People will go to a concert because they want to hear the music and the content might then get them to think about peace. People will go to a play because they're intrigued by the topic, 
but having a talk back afterwards will mean opening them to thinking about things in a different way. My particular skill um, that I brought to the table had to do with my involvement in theater and in uh, bringing people together uh, for an experience that uh, made them think about, you know, peace and war and the kind of Canada they want to live in. Whether it was a, a, a film theater or a stage uh, and taking advantage, a concert stage, and taking advantage of the power of the arts uh, to create um, uh, an atmosphere, uh, as it were, even to create an agenda for those conversations that take place. There happened to be a number of, of um, theater companies that were doing work that had some connection to um, war, and we were able to, um, in every case, um, add on to that that work by having talkbacks or having panel discussions. We did one at the Grand Theatre that was very heavy, very difficult, and yet we had wonderful people to help us process it and 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 with a talkback. They were great learning experiences. I think our greatest success was expanding peace work beyond you know, street demonstrations or um, that kind of thing, you know, militant meetings, etc. There's certainly room for that. But if you want to reach a whole much broader audience, then you ho hook your wagon to the stars of cultural groups that already exist and have their own existing audience. And, and the Remembrance Day uh, ceremonies, well, I don't like to call them ceremonies, um, events that we had every November the 11th, to think that we would do something like that in a military town, and I think we did it with such class and sensitivity. The obvious biggie is, was the concert, and, and we really were thrilled that Tricia Baldwin, who's the director of the um, Isabel Bader uh, Center, was keen to partner with us on, on this uh, concert and the concert, you know, we did three concerts, and uh, as a result of that, Trisha felt that the concert, Remembrance Day concert, was um, a, a, a great alternative for people who didn't want to do a traditional Remembrance Day thing, and, and now it's part of the Isabel's season. That is wonderful in itself that they want to continue this memorial with the mm. emphasis on peace every Remembrance Day. If you plan a protest, you will attract only people who agree with you. And we wanted to broaden that conversation. We wanted to reach people who may not have thought of things um, from the way that we were looking at them. You see, it's when people feel they need an enemy. It's almost as if they need an enemy. From the get-go, uh, I think Peace Quest has always valued uh, partnerships. Uh, we've never been able, we would never have been able to do what we've done without those partnerships. And living as we are in a military town, uh, it was important that uh, we explore our relationship with those families. Uh, men and women who have served in our armed forces. I think um, there may be some part of the word peace that is in some way uh, challenging in terms of the how the military views peace organizations and working with peace organizations. Uh, a lot of people think there's either you're for peace or you're for the military and being in a military town we had to deal with with some of that and and the understanding that being for peace does not mean that we don't honor people who have died in war that we don't respect our military the, the, those are not exclusive peace quest made a conscious decision to um try and reach out to both the CFB Kingston and also the Kingston Military Families Resource Centre. 
So we had meetings with them to talk about the kinds of things that we were doing, and particularly um, the Thousand Islands Playhouse collaboration over a play called Jake's Gift. We had every Friday evening after the performance, we had a talk, talk back that involved um, various aspects of uh, peace and war. And, and we also organized a panel discussion at the, before the, uh, a, a performance of uh, Waiting for the Parade um, that involved uh, a number of um, members uh, from the military. One was um, a military wife. One was a, a, a woman who was a, is a nurse in, uh, in, at CS, CFB Kingston. And, um, and one was actually a war bride. And, and they basically talked about women and, and war. Um, that was very exciting. Making those relationships work is, it's about listening. It's not about uh, uh, entering into a conversation with uh, a preset uh, agenda, uh, thinking that we have all the answers. Um, um, peace is a very complicated uh, goal, and uh, we knew we would have to rely on, on that collective wisdom from all uh, avenues of, of our community. I mean, it was because of that that uh, we were able to convince the commandant at CFB Kingston to um, engage in a conversation with Sister Pauline. Um, and I don't think that would have happened without the kind of groundwork that we did um, in, in reaching out to, to the military in that way. We were delighted that uh, they accepted our invitation. We met beforehand to lay out some ground rules and uh, uh, we found uh, the, the response was, was wonderful. We had a packed room. Uh, the conversations continued long after the evening, uh, the formal part of the evening shut down. And uh, I think that went a long way to demonstrate uh, to uh, uh, many people that uh, we were open to conversations with everyone because peace is a goal of everyone. Over the course of that conversation and many conversations, I found that the people who uh, are the strongest advocates for peace are often the ones who have experienced firsthand the hardships and challenges of violent conflict. And uh, the Canadian military certainly, um, they're certainly promoters of peace uh, as much as uh, any civilian I've met. Nobody wants war, especially those who have seen it and suffered through it. Yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Hi again. I'm popping in to give you a little more context for what we're about to see next. So, while in a way everything that we've learned about so far could be considered part of a whole long-term thinking scheme, the next few examples I feel specifically were great examples of long-term thinking that Peace Quest Kingston did right at the very beginning. So let's get started. One, they actively sought out and recruited volunteers that had specific skill sets that they needed in order to be successful. And that sounds easy on its own, but it required a lot of honesty about the limitations of themselves and the limitations of each other. Jamie and Pauline were looking to recruit people who had experience in the peace movement, uh, experience in uh, adult education and popular education, and uh, people who had a passion for social justice, and uh, people who knew how to collaborate and maybe, uh, yeah, looking for people who had a creative edge. I think a lot has to, uh, credit has to go to Jamie. He has a wide network. I have certainly uh, the religious and the educational uh, section. The people in the, that Jamie and Pauline attracted to Peace Quest brought all kinds of existing relationships. You know, so we had relationships through one volunteer with Queens. We had like relationships through me with a lot of organizations in the peace movement. Um, we had relationships through a couple of other volunteers with school boards and so on and so forth. So that, and, and if you look at where Peace Quest was successful, 
you can trace it back to those relationships that the volunteers brought to the table. You get the people you know. You have a network, you have a social network, and you think about people in that network who, number one, might be inclined to get involved in, in some peace promotion work. Number two, you think of people who have time. Others found out about it and asked to be part of it. And anyone that we asked said yes. Two. PeaceQuest wrote off the possibility of registering as a charity right at the beginning. Instead, we found a sponsoring organization under whom we could exist as a subset of their existing programming. At the outset, we were faced with, oh, should we register ourselves as an organization? Should we get charitable status, blah, blah, blah. We said, why would we do that if we can get that capacity in by partnering with another organization? And so then we agreed to do that. We went to a number of organizations and we found a good fit with World Federalists and they agreed to, to partner with us and bring their, uh, their capabilities and their structural capacity to the table. And it was a win-win for both organizations. World Federalists got a project that is aligned with their mission and uh, values, which they wouldn't have the capacity otherwise to deliver. Um, we did fundraising, which also benefited the financial capability of World Federalists. And World Federalists provide us with infrastructure and, um, uh, and capabilities that we didn't have and that we didn't have to build for ourselves. That sounds great, Michael, but how do you go about finding an organization willing to sponsor you? And then uh, secondly, um, putting reasonable parameters on the ask. And there has to be a win-win. If you can't identify the win-win, there's going to be a win for the sponsoring organization and a win for you. If you can't identify it, then that's just a sign it's not a good match. Three, they looked ahead to relevant dates and anniversaries that we already know would be getting a certain amount of media exposure. This allowed us to increase the odds that our press releases and events were going to be picked up and promoted. If, say, the anniversary of the Battle of the Somme in July of 1916 comes along, there will be a certain amount of media attention paid to that anniversary of this mass pointless slaughter um, in which hundreds of thousands of casualties were incurred on both sides, then if you come up with a press release or a statement saying what your position is, what our position w is, was, or Peace Quest's position was, people will pay attention because of the traction that anniversaries give you. Particularly when we began this project, uh, the government that was in power in Canada at the time was focusing on war as um, the idea that formed Canada and war as uh, the great connector rather than war as an unfortunate consequence. And so by focusing on those same anniversaries, we allowed people to look at something familiar in a new way. And four, they made sure all of our largest projects would live on as resource material beyond the life of the existing group. I will give you a few examples. On a local level, uh, there are a number of World War I related monuments and points of note, all within a 10 minute walking distance of downtown Kingston. We collaborated with historians and local media personalities to create a walking tour that has an audio component released on podcast platforms. So anyone can download the tour to their device and learn more about the lives of Kingstonians who are directly affected by that war. Um, on a more national scale, uh, we researched and curated a whole list of 150 Canadians who directly or indirectly contributed to peace work. And their images and biographies live on as a resource for teachers everywhere. Um, perhaps a little more internationally, uh, a partnership with a local children's author, Wallace Edwards, led to the creation of a unique children's book called What is Peace? And that in turn was distributed by Scholastic 
and translated into three languages. Another international example, uh, a partnership between a retired teacher, that was Judy, and an art therapist led to the creation of WarrenChildren.com. It's an online multimedia teaching resource for grades six and up. It's rich with both current and historical content available to teachers worldwide who want to bring more discussions of war and peace into their, into their classrooms. And just in case all of this is sounding a little too big and ambitious for perhaps the community group that you're in to achieve, you know, remember that resource building is just as useful on a small scale. Throughout all of these projects, we were continually adding to compilation lists of related material. One of them is a song list of choral music, pop songs, and folk songs have, that have themes of peace and war in them. Thank you very much, Jeff Piker. And the other thing we created was a list of teaching resources for all age groups, all across the board, of just stuff that's already out there on the web. All we did is we took what other people were doing and we just put it all into one place. That in and of itself is very helpful. Uh, anytime you run an event, uh, whoever makes your poster can save it in an edit format so you can keep the fonts and the graphics and if anyone else is offering uh, this kind of event they can use your stuff and that sometimes in the design world saves so much time uh, when you're trying to do things quickly and it's sometimes just a matter of taking what you've done and documenting it and sharing it away that others can use. Uh, one of the reasons why this uh, this little video that we're making now has so many different examples of everything that we've done, it's because I brought an audio recorder and a video recorder to almost all of the events that I was a part of. And that allowed us to create a running documentation. So if we ever got a volunteer who wanted to put video together for us. They had a whole bunch of uh, footage already to work with and all of the background music for this video was compiled <laughs> from the musical portions of the different events that we helped put on and it's really as simple as bringing those recording devices, you know, hitting record and then hitting stop when it's over and you don't even need to decide then what you're doing with it. It's just handy to have around. Those files can be sent to community radio, community media, independent media. That can help get the word out and sometimes increase the ch chances that your press releases get picked up or that your stories get told in media just because you already have existing content. Uh, and they don't, the media folks don't have to show up and create new content just to include you in their work. It's a amazing little trick. But I digress. Let's get back to those pitfalls. Thanks for listening. There were times when our efforts to recruit a more diverse volunteer base, for example, uh, was not as successful as we wanted. You know, that was a, a pitfall that we fell into. And I think it's really, really important for people who are thinking about their own organizations. From the very start, you should think about how big do you want your tent to be? And if you don't invite those people right from the start, it's going to be very, very difficult to get them. They need to be part of the visioning that you do at the very beginning. The volunteers that uh, Pauline and Jamie attracted, the work that we did and where we were successful was a reflection of the relationships. And similarly, the places where we failed to make good connections, uh, whether it was with Aboriginal, you know, First Nations people, whether it was with youth, uh, whether it was with uh, uh, immigrant populations, if you look around the table, th there were weak relationships with those groups at our level. So, so I mean, it, it's a reinforcement of what you're saying that at the outset, we didn't have those people help design the project from the, out, out, the get-go. So because we neglected that step, we didn't have youth with us from the very beginning. 
we didn't have indigenous voices. We didn't have uh, people much under the age of our original group of people. Um, we didn't have uh, disabled people. So I think we would have been much more successful reaching out to all those communities if we had understood from the start that they needed to be part of the process from the ground up. We tried later. We really tried to reach out. But it was there that we realized that it was too late, in fact. And we didn't really reach out, say, to successfully to, say, Kingston's indigenous communities or uh, minority communities, uh, although we did have some success in making institutional connections with faith communities that are not that weren't Christians. So that was, to some extent, successful. I think one of our weaknesses is we didn't engage young people enough, younger people enough, although we did have some success within the institutions of schools, but that's sort of, those aren't volunteers, those are people who, you know, little kids sometimes, you know, they go and they, you know, it's something that teacher tells them to do. I think our fate stream, we had good ideas, but it seemed to, it was a disappointment in ways to me. But we began to work with the group that was going to do the um, a 150th anniversary in the light of the faith communities in town. You know, what they had contribute to Canada. Well, we morphed right into that and it, we're continuing today. Like, that was just so wonderful. Like, we've had, what, three potlucks, one around social justice, one for around learning, one around social justice, one around the environment, and maybe one around peace is coming up. It's the diversity of conversations that Peace Quest can be most proud of. Uh, one of the legacies which continues to live on is uh, uh, there is now a Kingston Interfaith Council that was built uh, on the foundation laid by our faith stream. Now mind you that's not ours but it's something that our faith stream was able to morph into and, uh, and keep alive. Essentially we we were not terribly successful in the diversity file, but I hope that it was balanced off by what I see as our success in helping to change in some modest way the way Canadians thought about the anniversaries of the Great War. And we managed, I hope, to sort of tamp down the uber patriotism that's always out there and threatening to raise its ugly head above the parapet and getting people to think more about what lessons does one learn from a tragedy like the Great War. Deep in my heart, I do believe What I think is key is know your community. Uh, where are the youth active? Where are the Indigenous uh, uh, people active? How are they active? How is diversity reflected in your community and how can you draw upon that? So now every April I sit on my porch and I watch the parade pass before me. I see my old comrades how proudly they march renewing their dreams of past glory. I see these old soldiers, tired, stiff and sore, forgotten heroes of a forgotten war. And the young people ask, what are they marching for? And I ask myself the same question. And the band plays waltzing Matilda And the old men still answer the call Year after year, their numbers are fewer Soon no one will march there